There are 25 reasons to have a facelift or to have a breast augmentation. There are 55 not to. Mr. Andrea Morando is one of the leading plastic and cosmetic surgeons in the world. With many accreditations, including the International Society of Aesthetic Plastic Surgeons, his life's mission is to deliver life-changing experiences. We are very visual and with the Instagram and Facebook and TikTok, people are in front of a camera a lot more than you and I used to be. I'm Nicola Sands, and in this exclusive interview, Andrea Morando gives a rare insight into the mindset of a cosmetic surgeon at the very top of his game. Mr. Morando, can we start from the beginning? How did you get into the business that you're in today? I went to medical school in, uh, in Rome at the Catholic University, and my choice of uh, university was between university and music. I wanted to be uh, a pianist, and uh, the alternative would have been to be a doctor. Uh, I am a decent pianist, uh, but I think I'm a better doctor. So when I had to evaluate the different options for uh, what is going to be my life in the future, nowadays there are so many people tremendously talented that I knew that maybe medicine would have been a, a better option for me. So I went to Rome at university, and I think that initially every doctor wants to become an oncologist. They want to solve the issue of cancer and to want to change the world. Then I won a scholarship to go to Sweden, and that was, I think, in 1989. And it was the first time this Department of Plastic Surgery in Sweden, which is actually very well known in the world, was opening to medical students coming from abroad. And it is the Akademiska Hospital in, in, uh, in Uppsala. They opened up and I was the first medical student going there from a different country. And the chief of the department, uh, which was uh, um, Lena Tolsien, took me under his wing as if he was his son. And uh, the son that didn't want to do medicine, I was his son. And he took me to theater, introduced me to everybody, and the moment you have a, a teacher that she's inspiring, uh, even if it's something that you've never considered before, you buy into it. It's like having a, a good teacher of mathematics. You think you're not good at mathematics and they make you understand and appreciate and you love mathematics. So I spent uh, a couple of months in Sweden and then when I came back to, to Italy, I decided that what I wanted to do. And as a pianist, to a certain extent, I could see the interest in using my hands and uh, you, you have quite a bit of dexterity if you've been playing piano for a long time. So I came back to, to Italy, I went back, came back to Rome and I chose my department of plastic surgery. There was a lot of competition because uh, dentistry, plastic surgery, ophthalmologists and orthopedics are specialties which are very uh, uh, sought for. I managed to get into my residency of plastic surgery and it was five years of training. Were your parents in the medical profession? My father was a lawyer and he was in charge of the uh, commercial uh, um, custom uh, of one of the large arbors uh, and ports in Italy. And my mother was working for the Inland Revenue. So uh, th there was really n no medical in my uh, strict family. I have a, a, a couple of uh, um, aunties uh, and, and aunts which are uh, doctors and, and uh, cardiovascular surgeons, but there was nobody in the field of surgery per se as in terms of plastic. What did they think of your choice? I think I've been very lucky or maybe my parents have been very lucky because I am the kind of son that uh, liked to do what they wanted me to do. So some way, somehow, their expectations were my expectations. So I wanted to play the piano and usually parents like their children to play music, but it was my idea. So I started at the age of five. And when I decided to do medicine, my father and my mother were very happy because in Italy, traditionally, maybe no longer now, but traditionally, you want your children to be doctors or to be lawyers. You'd never consider your child to be having a business hmm? because it's not something that necessarily it's uh, as predictable. And uh, to be a doctor and to be a lawyer means that some way, somehow, you will always make a living. So the idea to work in a hospital, so you have your salary, the patients come to you, and your life is spanned out, which is, as a parent, what you would like to do for your children because you don't want your children to have too many challenges. You want them to be successful, but you want them to be in a safe place. So when I, uh, uh, it is actually an interesting story because uh, my father was from the very south of Italy for a wealthy, very wealthy family and he studied in Rome in the 50s. And that was the time of the, the Dolce Vita in Italy. So he had these amazing uh, stories that he used to tell me about Rome. And when I decided to go to university, in my own town, which is called Ancona, there is a university, there is a medical school, which is actually a good medical school. 
So I had the memories of what the, my father told me in terms of his stories, how beautiful was Rome in the 50s and in the 60s. And I went to him and said, Papa, I'm here. There is university in Ancona. I'll do medicine in Ancona. And he said, no, I think you should go somewhere else because if you do medicine here, it will be just like going to school. So as a man, you have to grow and you have to grow and find your experience. So I'm more than happy for you to go to Rome and to study in Rome. And I said, yes, but university here in Ancona is free. If I go to Rome, you'll have to pay for everything. I said, you know, I don't mind that. So in order to make myself feel less guilty of the fact that I was going to, to a certain extent, be on the shoulders of my father and my mother for quite a few years, uh, I said, okay, let's do this. I will apply for the Catholic University, which was the, at the time the only private university for medical school in Italy. If I get in, then at least I will be in a better position, so I have a justification to ask you to, to pay for everything. And I managed to get in, so there was no, no way out, and I went to Rome, and I had an amazing time. Do you think your father was right then to, to suggest that you go elsewhere? Definitely. Uh, I think that the kind of experience that you can do, even psychologically, if you know that you're not going home that weekend, that you cannot necessarily call your father because you have a minor problem, or your mother, for what matters. And it was interesting because I was living in a, uh, uh, in a college, in part of the university, uh, and the accommodation were not glamorous. Although it was a, a beautiful, expensive university, the accommodations are like a boarding school. And if you have your room with your privacy in your house, and then you have to share the, the, the facilities like the bathroom and the kitchen with another 20 medical students coming from different backgrounds, I think it teaches you how to cope with some minor challenges, uh, um, what potential you might face in the future when you will be in a different kind of environment, which is the reason why, uh, as we mentioned previously uh, in different conversations, we had boarding school uh, in England, which is a, a, quite a good opportunity, is a good way to have a, a first step into adult life without having your father and your mother behind. Do you think children these days can get a bit too reliant, maybe, on their parents? I think so, and uh, it's interesting that uh, uh, in England the model is starting to become more similar to the Italian model. So um, it's not unusual for uh, uh, children or teenagers or young men in Italy or young women for matters to live with their parents until they get married. It's very unlikely, unless you go and study somewhere else, that you're going to leave the home at 20 at the age of 20, uh, buy a house or rent a house and leave the family. As long as your mother is cooking and ironing your shirts and your father is giving you some money, you can leave at home until you're 35. Absolutely. And, and actually, I think that does happen more and more these days. But when you went into, um, into medicine, Mr. Morando, it wasn't initially into uh, cosmetic surgery, was it? No. Um, as I said, what made me turn into surgery, was experiencing the, the academic uh, in, uh, in, um, in, in Sweden. Then I won a scholarship to go to uh, uh, Madrid uh, in Spain, and it was another department, this time of thoracic surgery. And again, another amazing experience because you can really see what you can do with your hands if you are trained in a certain way. Once I finished my uh, plastic surgery uh, uh, degree and residency, then I went to Paris for one year and I worked in Paris in a cancer center. And again, it was an amazing experience. Then from there, I went to work in Milan for a while. Uh, I didn't think about cosmetic surgery at the time. Uh, then a series of events uh, brought me into that kind of direction. And uh, uh, again, uh, in life, you know where you start. You never know exactly which door will open after a second door. You turn right instead of left and your life takes a completely different direction. So what happened to take you in that direction? I had an opportunity, a colleague uh, contacted me from England saying that uh, there were not that many plastic surgeons in England and uh, it could have been an opportunity to go and see him operating. So I was quite happy in my hospital in Milan, but sometimes you feel that you would like to have another challenge. And uh, I came to England and I did like the new surgical challenge of cosmetic. And cosmetic, to a certain extent, is very different from plastic or for the other specialty per se. If you are a general surgeon, you have a patient who is unwell, who has a medical problem, and you have to take him from a position of disease to a position of health or restoring the health. In cosmetic, the challenge is different because you have patients who are healthy and they want to uh, enhance or improve or uh, restore what they used to have before still in a situation of health. 
So psychologically, it's a lot more difficult for a patient to decide to have surgery where the patient doesn't need surgery. So what I tend to my patient is that, no, there are 25 reasons to have a facelift or to have a breast augmentation. There are 55 not to. And if you ask your friends, not many people will say, that's an amazing idea. It's a personal decision. Uh, it's not necessarily a very easy journey because you have to be very convinced about what you're going to do. And surgery has its own risks. So you cannot say that you can guarantee what the outcome is going to be. If the patient has a, an issue with the appendix or the gallbladder, once the gallbladder has been removed, there is no way back. So it has been done and the problems have been sorted. In cosmetic, there is a, a level of satisfaction which is not only anatomical. It's anatomical and psychological. As a surgeon, you only have control over the anatomical part. So how much you removed, uh, how much you retighten, which size of implant you have uh, 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 inserted, or the amount of breast tissue you have removed in a breast reduction. But not necessarily this is going to correspond mathematically to how happy or unhappy the patient will be. Because the patient will see themselves in the mirror, and depending on how they perceive the cosmetic result, they might be happier or not. So the degree of satisfaction is partially anatomical and partially psychological. Hence, it's very difficult to assess the patient. What is it about cosmetic that you enjoy more than other aspects? I enjoy the relationship that you have to build up with the patients. I enjoy the element of trust. I enjoy the challenge to a certain extent. And I enjoy the fact that uh, in theatre you can achieve different cosmetic results and not necessarily everything is codified. So there are certain techniques to remove the appendix and there will be 10, 15 that there are anatomical variation. With regards to plastic surgery, there are something like 95 different techniques to reduce the breast. And every patient under that point of view is different. So the appendix is usually most of the time in the same position. The heart normally is on the left hand side. There are different kinds of challenges in, in surgery. But under the surgical point of view in plastic, sometimes you have to improvise. So there is an element that you face a uh, 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 a different kind of challenge that even if you have a lot of experience, you might not have solved before. So you have to stop for a second, assess the situation and say, okay, on the basis of what I learned in the past, how will this impact on the cosmetic result if I do this compared to something else? So would you say cosmetic surgery is more of an art form than other forms of surgery? I believe that there has to be an element hmm? uh, uh, because uh, you can be an amazing surgeon on paper but not necessarily you have the subtle skills that can get you out of certain challenging situations compared to something else. So I definitely believe that you can be a good surgeon in plastic and in cosmetic because you've studied a lot and you practice a lot. To take it to a slightly different level, I think is a combination of a little bit of element of art and a little bit of element of psychology. So you really have to try to get into the mind of your patients as much as this is possible. And and try to see whether there is any chance that you might be able to make that patient happy. What is the most difficult um, request you've ever had as a cosmetic surgeon? I have many stories, <laughs> and I'm not sure that it would be always uh, um, appropriate to report the stories, but the way patients or people see themselves is different sometimes from the way we see them. And I always put them in front of a their photographs to try to see to see whether what they see and what I see correspond. And I clearly remember a patient of mine many years ago and I put her in front of her photographs and she said, it's not me. So what she could see was totally different from what I could see. Wow. It's the same as uh, having a patient who's anorexic and they come to have a liposuction, you put them in front of the mirror, you see a patient who has a medical problem uh, and the patient is tremendously slim and unwell and this is something totally different. So it's trying to guide the patients to a point where the images tend to overlap and say, you know, on this basis, I don't really think I can help you. I remember many years ago, a gentleman came to see me and he was white Caucasian. And uh, uh, he said that he wanted to restore his features. But he said, I'm not white Caucasian. I'm actually from, I think, Tibet. So he would have had completely different features. And he said that the reason why his feature changed is because he was doing kickboxing, he had plenty of different fractures, so he did look white Caucasian, but he was not. And there was no way to try to make him understand this, and I don't really think this is the case. I think that you would probably benefit from the help of someone else, 
rather than me. And you always tell patients, no, you will find someone who is going to be happy to operate on you. But bear in mind that you have to come first. You don't have to follow a path if I'm trying to kindly advise you that this path is not going to take you in a good place. There is always someone who is happy to, to take you. There is always someone happy to take your money. But I'm not necessarily this is going to be beneficial for you. What is the most um, popular cosmetic surgery at the moment? I think that uh, I would probably divide them into two. Now, body contouring is very important and we are very visual and with the Instagram and Facebook and TikTok, people are in front of a camera a lot more than you and I used to be. Because uh, but I definitely come from a slightly different generation and uh, I started using digital photography maybe in 2001, 2002. So we didn't grow up having a phone in our hands. Now our children could take photographs, videos and upload them. So everybody has become a, a, a video maker or a, a, a content uh, a creator. So the moment you are in front of a camera, in front of your image a lot more, you tend to scrutinize a lot more. And the moment you are in front of other people's bodies and other people's faces, you always start to compare what you do like, what you don't like. On top of that, there are plenty of filters. And filters can modify the way you look without having to go through that step. And you can say, actually, I would like to be slightly taller. And I found recently a filter that can slightly elongate your legs. I would like to have a different color eyes. I would like to have a slightly smaller nose, a bigger chin or a fuller breast. I think this does create a lot of insecurity uh, because the parameters of beauty have changed. You know, from uh, uh, the past, when, uh, you know, uh, let me think about uh, uh, Tiziano or uh, Raffaello, where women used to be slightly uh, uh, healthier in terms of uh, fullness. To, more, uh, vol more voluptuous. Yes, then uh, there's been the criteria of beauty which has changed completely with the supermodel with Naomi Campbell and uh, uh, Christensen, where women tend to be quite slim. Then there's been the revolution of all the industry that was promoting, to a certain extent, an anorexic look, which is an unhealthy look. So they try to allow for women and men of every size and shape now to be portrayed as this is acceptable. This is creating a lot of insecurity in the younger generation, and therefore people tend to inspire to be slimmer, or taller, or spending a lot more time in to the gym. Uh, so it's, uh, this has created uh, a different market hmm? and depending on how ethical you are, you can get into the market or be out of the market. So basically, as a society, we're vainer than we've ever been. I think we are more aware of our appearance. Now, I think that vanity per se is not necessarily a sin, as long as you don't have to do anything illegal or anything immoral to fulfill your vanity. I think that looking after our health, which is psychological health, mental health, as much as physical health, is essential. Uh, it seems, according to the statistic, that the life expectancy in the Western world is actually decreasing. And it is probably decreasing because of the different issue that we have with nutrition and food and health. So uh, we have to look after what we eat. Uh, we have to look after our body. And in the same way, we have to look after our, not only on the, the, our engine, if you like, the, the body of the car we have. And uh, if in order to be slightly happier, you have to look after you know, your skin, uh, 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 your appearance, your weight, I think it's actually beneficial. There is a limit. If you go beyond the limit, instead of being a, 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 a gift that you've done to yourself becomes a problem. And would you become addicted? Yes and no. I think it depends on the personality. So, so, I mean, some people do, a minority, I would imagine, but, you know, there is such a thing as people getting addicted to having too much surgery. I think it, to a certain extent it is true. It is true that if there is something that bothers you, uh, you address it surgically or non-surgically, whatever it is, and you have an outcome which is quite close to what you expected, provided that the journey was uh, as pleasurable as it can be, if there is something else that bothers you, you would consider. Hmm? It doesn't mean you know, you're not happy with the nose, you address the nose, then you go to the chin, then you go to the breast, then you go to the abdomen. Uh, there has to be a balance, and to a certain extent, it has to be a conversation between the surgeon or the doctor and the patient. If the patient has an addictive personality and the patient will start to move the target from one place to the other, 
at some stage is going to be the duty of the surgeon to say, you know, I think that this is going to go in the wrong direction. I would really recommend not to do it. So there has to be an ethical responsibility of the medical practitioner as well. Okay, well, um, for full disclosure, um, you were my surgeon. I had my eye bags removed. Uh, I was very pleased with the result. But I had that done because people kept asking me if I was tired. Um, and I think uh, there's a hereditary issue in my family um, of eye bags. And uh, I looked in the mirror and I thought, yeah, I am looking really tired and I would like to do something about it, uh, which is which is why I came to you. Um, for those watching on YouTube, we'll have a before picture and an after picture so people can see the difference. But otherwise, we can describe it. But um, I was actually amazed with uh, what a difference it made. Is uh, eye bag removal one of your most popular procedures? Yes, I do a lot of eye bag removal, upper blepharoplasty, a lot of facial rejuvenations. And uh, in consideration of the fact that in the late 90s and the early 20s, there was a lot of breast surgery, there are many, many women who are coming to the end so to speak, of the life of their implant, which is on average 10 to 15 years, and they might have had children, their body might have changed, they might have uh, uh, um, uh, lost some weight, gained some weight, uh, and we all age. Uh, so I do, I would probably say 50% of my practice is uh, facial rejuvenation, which is eyes, faces, and neck, and the other 50% is uh, secondary corrective breast surgery. I mean, it's still a very image-based society, isn't it? People, people, uh, do judge on on appearance and that that is just a fact really isn't it i am more conscious of my body now than i was in my 20s i remember when i used to go to university none of my friends nobody used to go to the gym we used to study and nothing else nowadays if you go to the gym at six or seven o'clock in the morning the generation is from the age of 18 to the age of 70 and the people who are now 70 have decided to try to exercise because it's healthy and apparently the, the risk of Alzheimer's disease uh, is diminished of 35% if you exercise over the age of 50. So there are some actual benefit in that. But I think a lot is based on body image. So the model tend to have a, a, a six pack, big shoulders and a nice bicep. If you look at programs like um, Love Island or... Uh, on the beach with the X. Oh, yes. <laughs> yes. So, now, the men and the women have usually a fantastic physique. It's very unlikely we'll see someone who is tremendously overweight. And that's the target that everybody seems to be aspiring. It's very... It, do you think it's a good thing that um, those kind of images are set up for people to um, aspire to? Or do you think um, that's a negative? I don't think necessarily is a positive. I think that Everybody should try to be as healthy as possible. Exercising is good. Not drinking excessively is good. No smoking is good. And a healthy lifestyle is essential, ideally for longevity. And the, the Romans used to say, men sana in corpore sano, which means that if you look after your body and your body is healthy, it's more likely your mind will be healthy as well. Uh, everybody will find their path. So you can be very unhealthy being very slim and very healthy to be slightly overweight. Everybody has a different genetical pattern and to a certain extent there is only so much we can work on it. But we all have a responsibility for the body that we have. And uh, uh, I was reading somewhere, and I don't know if it is true that it was uh, 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 Steve Jobs saying that eat your food like your medicine, otherwise you will have to eat your medicine like your food. So, uh, And there is recently a program on Netflix called you are what you eat. So we really have to pay attention to our habits, lifestyle, uh, uh, way of living, uh, and what we, how we want to live our later life. You know, if you, on average, in certain parts of the world, you die at the age of 50, nowadays, thanks God, with the advances of medicine, we should live a lot longer. And so are you saying that surgery or cosmetic surgery should be part of a toolkit, but basically... You can't just use it as a quick fix. Yes. You really have to use it as part of a holistic approach, looking after your mind, yes. looking after your body. Yes. You've actually become one of the most successful surgeons in the UK, and one of the most renowned, respected. Um, but obviously that just doesn't happen overnight. Are you quite a disciplined person? My wife might disagree. <laughs> <laughs> but in certain environment, I am. I mean, I, uh, I relax in theatre, and I relax in the kitchen. 
uh, you, you tend to keep yourself updated as much as possible. There are plenty of different trends. You have to decide what is actually something you will be happy to offer to your patients. Uh, you have to select your clientele. I think that the, the most important thing is you have to be ethical. So you cannot operate on every patient you see. Uh, you have to try to understand what the patient wants to have, why they want to have it, and if there is a way to get them as close as possible to a degree of satisfaction. Complications happen in every surgery, uh, uh, for every surgeon in the world, no matter how skilled you are, as long as the percentage of complication is low, and you always have to reassess your result in relation as well to uh, the, the, the other colleagues and the, the other populations. When I, I'm operating the night before, I always in bed between 8 and 8.30. Uh, I hardly drink, also because I'm on call most of the time. And uh, the moment there is a patient who has any kind of problems, you have to be available for the patient. And uh, I always say that the patients who have some problems of any kind, and you look after the patients, they become your advocate. So uh, the reason why I like to believe I've been uh, fairly successful in my practice is because I look after my patients and my patients look after me. How do you handle the psychological aspect of working at the level that you do? Because it's not just the physical skill, which you obviously have, it's also the mental ability to deal with that level of pressure, I suppose, every day. It's not easy and not necessarily it gets easier in time because the moment you have one patient, you have a one potential liability. The moment you have a thousand patients, you have a, a 1,000 potential liability. So I try to limit the number of operations I do in a day, the number of surgeries I do in a week, because if you operate every single day on a large number of patients, it's going to be a lot more difficult to handle the patients, to be able to follow the patients the way they deserve to be followed as well. And you have to have some energy when you go back home. Otherwise, uh, you get addicted to work all the time and you lose your family life, you lose your children. And it is true that I've not really seen my children growing because I was working most of the time. They now see the reason why I was doing it. To a certain extent, it's also educational because uh, if you want to do something in life, most of the time you have to put the effort and you have to be consistent. So nothing happens in one day. I was uh, listening to uh, a TED talk a while ago and there was this... Uh, professor of a business, I think at Yale University in the United States, and she was saying, uh, how can success uh, uh, or luck be considered in business? Now, some people say, oh, I've been very lucky, or I have a lot of my success. Now, it's not only luck. Uh, uh, there has to be something ready for that. And what this uh, 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 professor of uh, business was saying, to a certain extent, uh, luck is like uh, having a boat. You're in the middle of the sea, if you don't prepare a sail ready to take the wind, even if the wind comes, you stay still. So you cannot say, well, I've been unlucky. Well, the wind didn't come, and I understand. But if the wind had come, you had not been ready. If you have the sail ready and the wind comes, then you can catch the wind. So there has to be an element. You, you have to be a little bit lucky in life. And this probably is uh, taking one road or one door or one turn rather than another. But you have to be prepared to, to put the work on it. Interesting. I've heard a similar saying that um, luck is when talent and hard work meets a moment of opportunity, which is very similar mm -hmm. to, to what you were saying. How important is who you marry to being successful? It's tremendously important because uh, if you like the biggest ally or the biggest enemy you will have in your life is the person you marry. And uh, uh, it took me a long time to find the right woman for me. And uh, I, I believe that the reason why in the end I stayed in England is because I, I met my wife. Uh, otherwise, I probably would have left the country, go somewhere else. And uh, Tonya, my wife, has always been my uh, uh, biggest fan to a certain extent uh, uh, and biggest stimulus in improving. So she's always uh, been on my side, uh, when things were easier, where things have been more difficult, and I think that we work well as a team. And uh, often you, when we all read different books and we listen to story, and nowadays everything seems to be quite public. Uh, but something which I found very interesting in people who divorced, hmm? uh, and high-profile people, is uh, that in a couple, your success is my success, 
my success is your success. So we work as a team. Uh, the same way as uh, Barack Obama and Michelle Obama worked as a team and they achieved what they achieved that nobody else until then had achieved. If you start to be envious of the success of your wife or the success of your husband, this is not going to go very well. So we have to work as a team. As a team, we fail. And as a team, we win. But we still stay together. Excellent advice. I, I couldn't agree more in that respect. And speaking of teams... How how hard has it been to, I mean, you've got an amazing team around you of people that you work with. How challenging has that been to build that? I think it took many years. Um, you learn to understand the way people think, not if you spend two hours with them, because people can lie mm. two or three hours. The moment you work with them on a regular basis, then you know the people that you would like to carry on working with or people that you would really like to try to avoid. So... I've been practicing for nearly 25 years in England. Uh, uh, often when I was working in different theater, in different hospitals, I had uh, uh, nurses and anesthetists and other people working in theater say, Mr. Morando, if you ever open an hospital, I would like to come and work with you. And uh, maybe it was said as a joke, but I've taken notes. <laughs> and of I'm the going ones you wanted yes or the one they wanted <laughs> and I remember the name of the one I don't want but definitely another one I wanted and I'm, I'm going through my list I have to say I managed to uh, uh, build up a team of people that I trust with my life and uh, the experience for the patient has to be the same with me as much as to be with my scrub nurses my ODP my recovery nurses my ward nurses my receptionists and everybody has to work exactly the same way You've just opened up um, a new clinic. Do you feel you're at a point in time now where everything is going right, everything is as you want it to be, or do you still feel you've got a long way to go? Well, building my own facilities has been a dream for a long time. And I have to say, even in this, my wife has been a, a, a driving a, a motivation into this. And the person who is the closest to you, as sees your up and down, is the one who's going to inject you with the trust. And she's the one who said, I think you should really do it. And she's been with me all the, all the way. It's not been easy because it's difficult to find the right location, to the right people to build it. You are going to have the design. And as a, a friend told me, if you're going to buy or to make your theater or to make your clinic, make it comfortable because it's going to be your grave. And to a certain extent, it's a big uh, commitment that you make. And that's a reflection of who you are and how you got there. I cannot say that I that the job is done. I think if anything is a new challenge, uh, I can um, work on what I've done so far. I'm sure there are plenty of other things that I can learn uh, because, as I said, I'm comfortable in theatre. I know what I do. Uh, this is a slightly different challenge. Uh, but again, as a team effort, I think that it's I'm very very proud of what we got and how we got here. Who who inspires you, both now and, you know, in the past? Um, you know, I've never been very competitive. And if, if I'm competitive, I'm not competitive towards another colleague, uh, another couple, uh, friends. I'm competitive towards myself. And you cannot win against yourself. The American model and the German model is that surgeons tend to have their own facilities and they can do their operation, their own facilities, so they're totally independent. I did like the idea to take a bit more control. I love the hospital in which I've been operating in the past, and I still operate there, because I think it's always good to be able to offer patients different alternatives. And uh, as I'm welcome, as I work very well in my previous hospital, there is no reason to leave them. But the idea to have full control from uh, the way you answer the phone call uh, how many times you can see a patient if the patient needs to be seen, uh, the food that it is offered to the patients, the quality of the coffee. It might be paranoid, but I think that attention to details makes a big difference. And maybe that's the reason why I decided to go in this direction. Having that full control, that autonomy, that is your ideal. Yes. It's, uh, in life, you cannot control everything. Mm. There are certain things which are out of your ability to control. Uh, but at least what you can control, you should try to control. And uh, the more control you have, the less likely is that you find yourself in a situation in which you have to say, no, it's out of my uh, realm of uh, ability. So the more control you have, 
at least in that kind of environment. In life, sometimes something has to happen, it happens. In theater and in the kitchen, no, you have your tools, you prepared well, and you know the amount of time that you usually take. Then there are some uh, 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 things that are not predictable, but you limit those as much as possible. And if you prepare well, you limit your potential issues. Have you, have you ever had any criticism for the field of work that you're in? Uh, in terms of criticism from other people? Um, so yeah, why, do you, uh, why as a surgeon, why did you choose cosmetic? Is yes, it okay. maybe. Because uh, I think possibly in America it's, mm -hmm. it's more um, widely accepted, but possibly in the UK... Um, there's still some controversy over cosmetic surgery. Why would you put yourself through something that's not necessary? That kind of thing. Do you experience any occasionally? Of that? Yes, I, mean, I understand that. Uh, I, I remember in the past, sometimes I had a, 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 a friend who was a GP and said, no, "But why patients would really come and do something and try to address it if it's not being broken?" So the idea of uh, if it's not broken, why do you fix it? Until this point of view, I mean, mental health is actually very important. Now, you have patients at the age of 20 and you have patients at the age of 82. Hmm? And uh, I had patients who had generous, large, heavy breasts at the age of 70. And I said, I lived all my life with this and this is impacting on my daily life. Now, finally, I can do something about it. Is it feasible? And I don't have to judge ethically if... Uh, uh, it is the right decision. I can say, under the surgical point of view, this is feasible, these are the benefits, these are the risks. Are you really sure you want to do this? Do you think this is going to add something to your life? Yes or no. Obviously, I have to guide the patients. If I believe that it's not going to be a good idea, I have to politely disclose it to the patient. If I think that it's something that I'll be prepared to do on my sister, on my mother, or a close friend, then I have to disclose it to the patient. I recently had a very pleasant patient, lady is uh, 87 or 88 years old, and she wanted to have surgery. And I said, really, I think that the benefits that you will get out of this are significantly lower than the risk that you've taken. At your age, with all due respect, I think that you should make, and you could make a much better use of your energy and also of your money. Hmm? And uh, patients might have been disappointed, but I would like to believe that if my mother had gone and see a surgeon, she would have actually exactly done the same thing. Is there an upper age limit and a lower age limit that you have? The lower age limit is 18, but it also depends on the psychology of the patient. So uh, at the age of 18, sometimes certain things seem to be an amazing idea. And when you're 30, you realize that it was not a good idea. So the process, the consultation is a lot longer. And I always try to involve at least a member of the family, because the last thing you want to do is to operate on a patient who is young, maybe emotionally, emotionally not entirely mature, uh, and you, you want to make sure that you cover all the possible aspects. Uh, an upper age uh, limit, I would probably say early 80s, but it depends on how the patient is. I had a patient uh, who uh, fit and well, swimming three times a week, uh, three times the level of my energy, and uh, she had a good indication for surgery. She was very sensible. She had the, the network around her to allow her to rest adequately after surgery. And I thought that it was a good idea. What qualities for people who are interested in achieving what you have and going along the same sort of path, what qualities are required to do well, to be successful as a cosmetic surgery? I think you have to be uh, a, a decent person. I think you have to have your ethics uh, in the right place because it's easy to be carried away and uh, life is not as uh, glamorous as in Nip and Tuck, the, the series that uh, came from America. You have to look after your patients, you have to prepare to uh, reassess your priorities on a regular basis and you have to keep yourself updated. Uh, remember there is not a competition against the others, there are plenty of surgeons and the room for everybody. You have to keep your garden nice and tidy. Okay, so w would you recommend it as a career choice to younger people going into medicine? Would you encourage people to go along that route? Uh, it's a long way. It's a long career. It takes many, many sacrifices. Uh, you cannot ever be sure that you will be exactly where you would like to be because there are so many things that can happen on the way that can diverse in one direction or in a different direction. Uh, if 
surgery is what you like. If you like the idea of uh, operating on patients, seeing uh, the psychological changes that sometimes a physical changes brings, as long as you know that is, uh, you will sacrifice uh, days and nights and uh, family events and gathering, and you might be called at midnight uh, uh, when you're spending time with your mother, uh, then yes. Uh, will my children go to medicine? I think they've seen the sacrifices that I made, so maybe they will not be too inclined in that career. If it is just for making a living, there are many other ways to make a living easier, where you can actually have a financial reward a lot sooner. Uh, but you have to follow your passion. Absolutely. What do you do outside of work to relax? As I mentioned, I like to cook. So sometimes after a long day in theatre, I call my wife and say, please don't go to the kitchen. I will come home, I will have a look and I will cook because again, you are more in control and uh, uh, you can leave the world outside for a while. I play the piano as and when I have the time. Uh, uh, time is shrinking, but I at least I have my grand piano at home that it is my present that I made to myself many years ago. I like to read. Uh, unfortunately, when I read anything which is not medical, I feel guilty. Uh, because the moment you dedicated the vast majority of your life to this, you want to make sure that you read the, 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 the newest article, you're updated with the newest technique, and you see what everybody else does. So you're still learning every day. You're still oh, learning absolutely. about your industry. Yes. And how fast is it changing? It's changing very quickly. Uh, a lot more people are interested in plastic surgery. A lot more people are interested in cosmetic surgery. Many more surgeons are uh, uh, on the horizon, so different technique, different expectations, shorter recovery, going back to normal life sooner rather than later. Hence, a few things that you used to do in a certain way 20 years ago are no longer applicable. So you really have to try to, I wouldn't say reinvent yourself, but take what you think is safe and see what you can do to improve it, to improve the longevity of the cosmetic result to improve the skin of the patient before they have surgery, to make sure that they maintain the asset for as long as possible. If you start having surgery when you are 20 or 25 for breast surgery, you will need more surgery in the future. If you start with facial rejuvenation in your 30 or in your 40s, the moment you start to see a wrinkle coming back, you will still be alert that you're ready to do something else. But it has to come from the inside, so food, nutrition, lifestyle, and this is, as you said before correctly, is just another tool to make sure that you look after the engine as much as you look after the body of the car. Non-surgical procedures, are, you, you do those too, and they're very, very popular, but it's, it's unregulated, isn't it, the, the non-surgical procedures? Do you think as we go forward and more and more people want these procedures, it will become more regulated? Because you do see online in publications a lot of bad work lip i'm talking about lip fillers and things like that i think regulation is essential uh even more in a, a country like england mm. uh, uh, or any civilized country because uh, it it applies to every single category you can have um, amazing doctors and not so amazing doctor amazing nurses and not so amazing nurses beauty therapists the ethics is behind uh, the criteria of a beauty have changed, so you mentioned the uh, uh, full lips. Some patients love the kind of look, and as long as they're happy and it has been done adequately, that I, I cannot really criticize, and other people don't really want anybody to notice that they had a slight enhancement. So it's very uh, 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 personal as the approach. But I think that regulating something which is medical is essential because... Uh, Otherwise, there is no end to potentially what might happen. So what, what, are your, what are your hopes for the future now? My aim is to continue practicing the way I do, potentially having even more control on what I do. Medicine and surgery and plastic has really taken over my life. Uh, so it's very unlikely that unless uh, anything happens to my health, uh, I would really leave completely working. I would love to have uh, colleagues that work with me and I would love to share the experience and you always uh, learn and enrich yourself and the others if you compare it. So that having a team around me will be probably my, uh, my biggest aspiration and as and when possible to spend a bit more time with my wife and children. Would you maybe have some sort of academy in the future, you know, that, to teach others your methods and your learnings and your ways of doing things? 
I would like that. I would like the, 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 to have the, the time and the possibility to pass what I've learned to younger colleagues. Uh, uh, and I'm sure that in the same process, you give something and you get something back. It's not very easy to uh, uh, find people who have the same kind of mentality, who are prepared uh, to, to do something like this. So that's probably the, the challenge to find someone who is on my same wavelength to take under my wings, so to speak, and to share with them, with him or with her, what I've learned uh, uh, to make hopefully their journey slightly easier. Okay, well, finally, um, if you could sum up your career so far, how would you do that? How would you sum up what it's taken for you to get to where you are today? How would you sum that up? It has been a long journey. Uh, I... I cannot emphasize how long it has been and how many challenges. Also because to establish yourself in your own country is difficult. Establish yourself in a different country, I think, is even more difficult. I have no regrets. Um, the northwest of England is a, a beautiful place. With a bit of sunshine and less rain, it would be even better. Uh, but I feel that I've, I've been very lucky uh, to be ready when the wind has come and uh, to have the people around me who've been supporting me all the way throughout the journey. Okay, well, Mr. Miranda, thanks so much for coming in there, sharing your journey. It's been absolutely fascinating and the very, very best of luck with um, your new clinic going forward. Thank you for having me. Thank you for inviting me. Pleasure has been mine.